Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about some tanks, effectively originating from late World War I, although conceptualized years or even centuries prior, these large, heavily armed and armored vehicles serve today and back then as important pieces of a military. Their size can make them useful for moving men and materiel, their armor protects whoever or whatever lies within, and their often large and or numerous guns make them fantastic for direct combat against enemy forces, armored or unarmored. Depending on the class of the tank, they can also be pretty fast, at least as far as a several-ton steel behemoth can be considered fast. For example, in World War II, the M18 Hellcat, a tank destroyer, could reach speeds upwards of 55 miles an hour. Think of that the next time you're on the highway. Imagine a 17-ton tank matching your speed. It would be pretty terrifying. These really, really fast tanks aside, there is at least one major problem with tanks as a whole, and that is the issue of moving them over great distances. There certainly are other issues, don't get me wrong, but because of their weight and general poor fuel efficiency, actually moving tanks to distant locations can be quite the problem. Back in the day, and even today, quite honestly, moving tanks over roads required designated tank transport vehicles, basically large trucks with trailers, and wherever possible, they would be transported by rail car. Tanks often didn't travel significant distances under their own power. They used other vehicles to do that for them which raises the question of what you would do if you wanted to put tanks in a place where you kind of couldn't, like behind enemy lines, or if you wanted to quickly deploy tanks to the front line. One prospective answer in World War II was the idea of winged or flying tanks, basically tanks outfitted with wings in one form or another that would fly down onto the battlefield, detach their wings, and fight the enemy. Several major powers would toy with the idea, America in the mid to late 30s with a prospective design by John Walter Christie, Britain with the Baines Bat, Russia with the famous Antonov A-40, probably the most recognizable of the flying tank concepts of this period, and even Japan got in on the action with a design of their own, that I think would have been the absolute dumbest and most useless of the bunch. This is Japan's mid-war attempt to make a flying tank. This is the Special Tank No. 3 Kuro, also known as the Maeda Ku-6. First though, I want to look a bit more into the Russian project and the issues with that, because it is representative of what Japan would need to do successfully to make the flying tank a reality. Because of the sheer weight of just about any tank that exists, to make a flying tank, it almost went without saying for the Soviets that the tank that they would be strapping some wings on would have to be a light tank, not only for the sake of the flying capabilities of the tank itself, but the flying of the plane that would be initially carrying it. These flying tanks were gliders, either attached directly to the body of a parent aircraft or towed behind it and released somewhere along the way. In some initial tests, the Soviets would drop T-27 tankettes, basically really, really small tanks, and T-37 light tanks from bombers with or without parachutes, prey for the suspensions and those inside the tanks on those drops. While these did technically work, the Soviets weren't satisfied, and I personally do question how valuable these light and tankettes would have been considering that each of those tanks only had a machine gun as its armament. So would there really be that much value in dropping that over a truck or jeep with the same armament, or really just a couple guys with a machine gun? You could drop a lot more of those than you could tanks. So in 1942, the Soviets upgraded the tank that they were flying in and the method that they would use to fly it in. The armor would be a T-60 light tank, armed with a 20mm cannon and a machine gun. And instead of dropping in by parachute, it would glide in, outfitted with biplane wings 18 meters wide and a sort of twin-boom tail, 
even with these large wings and using one of the smallest tanks they had available, the weight of the tank had to be further reduced to make the concept even remotely viable. This would mean the temporary removal of the weaponry, the ammo, the headlights of all things, and most of the tank's fuel. Basically, to make it work, they had to turn the tank into an armored shell that could move barely. Presumably, the rest of the tank would be dropped in separately, which then raises even more questions than it answers. How long would it take to reassemble the tank? What if the tank's parts traveled further than the tank itself? Would it really be worth it to effectively have to reassemble a tank while likely under enemy fire? Ultimately, in part because of this, in part because its gross flying weight of just under 18,000 pounds was still too heavy and even large Soviet bombers would struggle to tow it into the air, the Soviet flying tank project was abandoned. A year later, in 1943, Japan, to what I could find unaware of the Soviet project, embarked on their own flying tank project that almost seemed to learn from the issues of the Soviet project. Clearly, the biggest issue with the Soviet project was that the tank that they were using was just too heavy to be viable. So Japan would either have to significantly reduce tank weight or increase the power of the towing aircraft. For the weight aspect, Japan was no stranger to light tanks, and their most common tank used during the war was a light tank, the Type 95 Ha Go, a tank that doesn't have the greatest reputation, all things considered. But to be fair, Japanese armor as a whole doesn't have the greatest reputation. Honestly, it's not hard to see why tanks like the Type 95 don't have a great reputation today. They were lightly armed with just a 37mm cannon, and their armor maxed out at just 12 millimeters thick. It was kind of a glass cannon, and it was a pretty small cannon at that. Compare this to America's most common tank, the M4 Sherman, which had armor up to 76 millimeters thick and was armed with a 75 millimeter or 105 millimeter cannon, a major difference. So for Japan's flying tank, they would need something much smaller than the Type 95, which still came in at 7.4 tons, or around 16,000 pounds. Keep in mind that the total weight of the Soviet's design was around 7.8 tons, and around 5.8 tons for the tank alone. In their current arsenal of armored vehicles, the most sensible options were their tankettes, the Type 92, Type 94, and Type 97 all ranging from 3.4 to 4.7 tons. The largest of the bunch, the Type 97, had armor up to 16 millimeters thick and was armed with a 37 millimeter cannon, which probably would make it the most viable of these three. The other two were only armed with machine guns, so, you know, probably not as viable. Still, even at 3.4 tons minimum for the smaller ones, this was still considered too heavy for the project, so a new, even lighter tank would have to be designed. It wouldn't be an entirely new design, but rather a scaled-down, trimmed-down version of a Type 98 light tank, a tank that was intended to replace the Type 95 somewhere down the road. This tank as a baseline weighed 7.2 tons, so it would have to be trimmed down severely. Their resulting tank design, the Special Tank No. 3 Kuro, had its weight reduced down to just 2.9 tons, measuring in at 4.07 meters long, 1.44 meters wide, and 1.89 meters tall. Inside would be a two-man crew of the driver and commander, the latter of whom was also the gunner. The armament would ideally vary. At best, it would have a 37mm cannon, otherwise it would have either a 7.7mm machine gun or a flamethrower. As for its armor, that's actually unknown. Presumably, combining its small size and complete lack of weight for a tank, its armor probably wouldn't be, on average, more than just a few millimeters thick, incredibly light. For its flying or gliding design, it would differ from the Soviets in that it was a monoplane, 
with two wing sections attached directly to the body just under the turret, and a T-style tail extending out from the back. Inside, the driver or commander would have access to some kind of wired system that would connect to control surfaces on the wings, so they weren't just left to the hands of fate. They would also design a second glider type, this time connecting to the very top of the tank as a single unit, and now also with a twin boom tail. The total weight of the tank with its wings was to be around 4.2 tons. For the basically second half of the concept, what would be the plane that was bringing the Ku-6 into the air? Assigned for this task was the Mitsubishi Ki-21 Heavy Bomber. I assume it was selected due to its relatively decent power and numerical prevalence, being the second most produced Japanese bomber in the war. While its payload was rather small at just 2,200 pounds, its top speed of 301 miles an hour and having two relatively powerful 1500 horsepower engines made it a decent choice, all things considered. Plus, Japan didn't really have any bombers with massive payloads or anything like that, so something like the Ki-21 was the best that they were really going to do. The Ku-6 would be tethered to the tail of the Ki-21, and for takeoff and presumably landing, the Ku-6 would be sat on some skids or skis, this was because the takeoff speed was upwards of 100 miles an hour, and the tank's top speed was just 27 miles an hour. So to avoid damaging the treads or the runway that they were on, tilling the soil like a mad farmer, some detachable skids would be used, and presumably they would stay on until after landing, to be removed along with the rest of the glider parts. Ultimately, though, the Ku-6 project would only ever make it to the prototype phase and would never actually be tested. It never got the chance to ski. Maeda would complete a prototype glider design, and Mitsubishi only made a tank mock-up before the project was cancelled sometime in late 1944, early 1945. The changing war situation with allies having air superiority meant that any flying tanks would be sitting ducks. Plus, with how small and likely weak the tank would have been, there probably wouldn't have been all that much value unless Japan somehow managed to shotgun blast them out over enemy skies and behind enemy lines. On its own, such an underpowered, under-armored tank would be easy pickings. In a mass group, it would be a much tougher fight. But also, if a bomber was to be carrying one of these behind it, I assume it would probably have to give up its normal payload, and I do think it would be far more valuable for the bomber just to have its normal payload and bomb enemy positions. Then they wouldn't have to go through the hassle of flying a tank into the battlefield and upon landing basically run out and disassemble part of it. Or perhaps they could have just went back to the parachute idea like the Soviets did initially and just get a really big parachute. But in the end, though, it really isn't all that surprising that the whole flying tank concept didn't take off. Hey. While it is interesting in theory, it was really just impractical and overall cumbersome. It's a fun idea, but it's largely just that. It's a fun idea, not necessarily a good one. All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I do love that a lot of major countries embarked on this flying tank concept. Like everybody had the same stupid idea at the same time and didn't decide to ignore it. But, you know, I guess a lot of designs don't work out, and you do have to try new things, so there's that. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.